Good afternoon, everyone. With me to my right is the woman who needs... Actually, she's not here. Uh, but another familiar face uh, to my right, the state's epidemiologist, Dr. Christina Tantina. Great to have you with us. To my left, the superintendent of the state police, another guy who needs no introduction, Colonel Pat Callahan. We have Jared Maples in the Office of Homeland Security Preparedness, Paramount Guard, Chief Counsel, and a cast of thousands. Today is a big day for our vaccination efforts. Today, everyone who lives, works, or studies in New Jersey, ages 16 and over, is now eligible to be vaccinated. And a reminder that at this time, this may change, but at this time, those ages 16 and 17 can only receive the Pfizer vaccine, which has emergency use authorization for these individuals. And by the way, if you're 16 or 17, you must be accompanied by a parent or legal guardian to be vaccinated. Across the state, there are hundreds of locations where you can be vaccinated from our six mega sites to the federally operated community-based vaccination center at NJIT to hundreds of doctor's offices and local health care centers and pharmacies. Last check, my number is we're now well over 800 different locations. And as we have noted before, 98.7% of all New Jersey residents live within five miles of where they can get vaccinated. We encourage you to visit covid19.nj.gov slash finder to locate a vaccination center near you. And since its launch a few weeks ago, the vaccine finder has been accessed by more than one, uh, by more than one million times. The vaccine finder updates multiple times an hour with information from multiple sites and lists appointment openings as they become known and available. Early Earlier this morning, the vaccine finder was showing 68 locations with availability, representing thousands of open appointments. Everyone who had registered online to the NJ vaccine scheduling system is now receiving their email notification about today's eligibility expansion. A total of 2.8 million email reminders were delivered as of noon. And my family got several of them. More than 700,000 appointments have been booked directly through the NJVSS portal on our COVID-19 information hub. Now, we know the appointments listed as open this morning will likely fill up fast, and it may take a little time to find a slot as the vaccine supply continues uh, to not quite uh, stay up with the demand, especially in light of the continued pause in the administration of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. But I assure you, your patience will pay off. Even with today's final expansion, millions of residents who had previously been made eligible have already received at least their first shots. We know that's now over six million shots in the arms, by the way. So we know that we are ready to keep pushing forward. With a total this morning of 2,507,736 fully vaccinated individuals, we are now well more than halfway to our initial goal of 4.7 million uh, folks by the end of June. Over the past week, we continue to move the doses of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines we received from the federal government to our vaccine centers to be delivered directly into the arms of New Jerseyans. Again, we're not spiking in any footballs here. We are on a journey, and there are many of you still trying to get your appointments, but we continue to rank among the very top in the nation and the four key metrics for evaluating our vaccination program. The percent of doses received getting into the arms of residents, the number of doses we are administering daily, the percentage of residents who have received at least a first dose, and the percentage of our total population who are now fully vaccinated. And as I've noted before, many of the states ahead of us, and there's no disrespect to them, don't have populations that in some cases can compare with uh, places like Bergen County or Essex County. So we are truly setting a national example here in New Jersey. I'll get to all the other numbers in a minute, but first I do want to acknowledge that this is National Volunteer Week. So with that, I want to give a shout out en masse to all of the volunteer advocates from the Office of the Long-Term Care Ombudsman, who have been a lifeline throughout this crisis for residents in our nursing homes. These are selfless volunteers who, prior to the pandemic, visited assigned nursing homes for at least four hours every week, sitting and speaking with residents, listening to their concerns, 
and working with the nursing staff to resolve problems for the resident. Once the pandemic took hold, these essential volunteers continue to maintain their connections with residents and families, even though they may not have been able to physically be with them. And in particular, I want to highlight two of these volunteers who are making a difference in the lives of residents in our nursing homes. Uh, first up, on the left, Lakeisha Leach is an Air Force veteran and a volunteer with Jefferson Healthcare Center in Washington Township in Gloucester County. Over the past year, she has held weekly Zoom meetings with the residents she works with, keeping open vital lines of communication to ensure she knew what was happening at the facilities where she dedicated her time. For many residents, the weekly check-ins with Lakeisha was a chance to hear from a friendly face, to talk about memories and hopes for the future. Another volunteer on the right, Laura Redmond, who was assigned to a Vista Care in Cherry Hill in Camden County. In the depth of winter, Laura personally crafted cards and notes for her residents and delivered them to the nursing home where they were gratefully and enthusiastically received by the residents she has gotten to know and advocate for. One resident in particular is a 92-year-old Holocaust survivor with a deep love of reading. Knowing this, Laura delivers books to her friend and they chat on the phone about books and about life in weekly phone calls. Laura's and Lakeisha's passion and ingenuity are inspiring and they are representative of the passion and ingenuity of every volunteer ombudsman. State long-term care ombudsman Laurie Brewer is always looking for volunteers. And if you are interested in serving as a lifeline to the residents in our nursing homes, I encourage you to call, uh, not Laurie necessarily directly, but call the ombudsman's office. And that's the number, 1-877-582-6995. That's 877-582-6995. Again, to Lori Brewer and her entire team, staff, volunteers, Laura, Lakeisha, and many like them, thank you. And to every New Jerseyan who has given their time over the past year to support their community, I also thank you. You've heard me say it many, many times, we are a family, a large, diverse, sometimes boisterous, but always close-knit family. It has been the efforts of so many of you in the many ways you have volunteered who have made our family stronger and more resilient. So to each and every one of you, I say thank you. Now let's review the rest of today's numbers. First, I want to take a quick look at the latest from our schools. As the school week opens, we've got 186 districts, and you can read this in front of you, that are all in person. That's 170,000 students. Uh, that's moving in the right direction. Another 887,000 students uh, are on a hybrid schedule. Again, that's an increase of 77,000 since last week. The numbers on all remote is 69 with roughly 219,000 students. That's down a bunch of districts and more than 100,000 students from a week ago. And finally, 78,000 students are in 30 districts or schools which have a mix of all of the above. And this is a decrease from, of a couple from last week. I should note that pre-K through grade two, students in Camden started on a hybrid schedule today and I joined their educators in welcoming them back. Switching to tests, we are reporting an additional 2,323 positive, either PCR or presumed positive antigen rapid test results. With these numbers, the statewide rate of transmission today is 0.92. The one-day positivity is 8.18. That's based on 42,217 PCR tests recorded last Thursday. Our census in our hospitals last night, 2,062, 1,948 of whom were confirmed COVID positive. Of that universe, 435 patients were in our ICUs and 250 of them required a ventilator. Across the day yesterday, 208 live patients were discharged statewide. 233 patients were admitted in our hospitals. These are not confirmed, reported 24 in hospital deaths. And with the heaviest of hearts, today we must, must report an additional 18 deaths that are in fact confirmed to be from complications of COVID-19. We have lost more than 25,000 New Jerseyans over the past 13 months. So that's a combination of 22,569 confirmed 
and 2,592 probable losses of life due to COVID. And to ensure that these blessed souls never just become a num number, let's take a minute as we do every day to honor the lives of three who we have lost recently. I want to begin today by remembering Newark's Kenneth Richardson. Kenneth was 72 years old. He was a Brick City native, born and raised, a graduate of Barringer High, High School and a standout athlete who would be enshrined in the Newark Athletic Hall of Fame in the year 2010. He had a varied career starting in high school when he would make sandwiches at a catering company. He drove trailers. He worked for the city of Newark. But for the past nearly 16 years, he had been a field compliance inspector in the Grants Administration Department for the Schools Development Authority. Kenneth leaves behind his wife, Jerlene, with whom he had celebrated his 50th wedding anniversary this past February. He's also survived by two of his and Jerlene's children, Kenneth and Nicole, and I had the great honor of speaking with Jerlene, Kenneth, and Nicole last Wednesday. He was sadly predeceased by his daughter, Kim. He also leaves behind his grandkids, Kayla, Kyla, Kanaya, Damaya, Gregory, and Elijah, and a great-granddaughter, Kennedy. And of course, he leaves behind the members of his SDA family who will remember him fondly, and I want to thank Joy Johnson and Manny De Silva for bringing Kenneth's life and loss to our attention. For everything across a lifetime of commitment to Newark and our state, we simply say thank you, Kenneth. May God bless and watch over you, the family you leave behind, and your many friends. Next, this one's tough as nails. We remember Piscataway's Billy Burke on the right and his father, Bill Burke of Hillsborough, on the left. They were both longtime Staten Islanders who had made Jersey their home over the past several years. Billy Burke was a retired member of the New York City Fire Department. It was a long, lifelong dream of him, of his, to be a firefighter. And he spent significant time as a member of the FDNY team that worked at the site of the World Trade Center following the September 11th attacks. Following his retirement from the department, he started his own trucking company, <clears throat> excuse me, William Joseph Trucking, which while keeping him busy also allowed him to spend more time with his family, to coach youth basketball and baseball, and attend dance recitals. Billy had only moved to Piscataway three years ago. He leaves behind his children, Haley, Sarah, and William, his mother Patricia, among countless friends and members of the FDNY family. God bless that guy. But three weeks after losing Billy, again, Billy's on the right, the Burke family lost its patriarch on the left, Bill, at the age of 83. Also born and raised on Staten Island after a stint as a cook in the U.S. Army, Bill earned a degree in accounting and embarked on a career in business that would see him spend the majority of his time at the investment firm Solomon Brothers, where he was a vice president. Bill was a dyed-in-the-wool sports fan. Pat, make sure you're paying attention here because this one moves around a bit. He grew up a Brooklyn Dodgers fan who never got over Bobby Thompson's shot heard around the world. Uh, not many people uh, did. And he was forced to switch allegiances after the Dodgers left Brooklyn for Los Angeles. And those allegiances were split between the Mets and the Red Sox. Think about that for a second. And when it came to football, there was only one team the New York football giants. Bill leaves behind his daughter and Billy's sister, Laura, and I had the great honor of speaking with Laura on Wednesday. And in addition to Billy's children, he also is survived by another grandson, Connor, as well as by his brother and Billy's uncle, David. Both father and son were especially proud of their Irish heritage. And as Billy would often remind his children, the pot of gold can be found at the center of the heart and not always at the end of the rainbow. We hope those words and their true meaning provide comfort. We are honored that the Burks would come to call New Jersey home and that they joined our family. And we will remember them both, and we pray that God blesses each of them and the families they leave behind. Just as we pray, he blesses every family who has lost a loved one to this virus. As I noted a few minutes ago, we remember Kenneth, Billy, and Bill, and every one of the hundreds of others we have honored from this table from among the more than 25,000 lost to ensure that we always remember that these are real people, real faces 
with real families left behind. We don't want anyone ever, ever, ever to just be a, a number. We honor them all. Let's switch gears and end the day on this side at least with some good news. This guy is Jesus Calderon, known as Jay by many. He is a Cuban immigrant who is called New Jersey and specifically Perth Amboy, home for the past 40 years. Jesus owns Your Cuban Cafe, located next door to Perth Amboy's NJ Transit Rail Station. Prior to the pandemic, Your Cuban Cafe was the place to grab a cup of coffee and a quick breakfast before grabbing a train to work or school or to pick up a plate of traditional rice and beans on the way home. When the pandemic took hold, however, the crowds that kept Jesus's dream going disappeared and the future of Your Cuban Cap Cafe was put in doubt. Thankfully, Perth Amboy has been working with the Department of Community Affairs to receive direct grant funding through its Neighborhood Preservation COVID-19 Relief Grant Program. And Jesus was also able to get vital assistance through that. Not only has the DCA funding allowed him to catch up on his expenses, but he was able to set the restaurant up to take online orders for the first time. Today, Jesus uh, and your Cuban Cafe continue to serve the Perth Amboy community. I had the opportunity to catch up with him last Wednesday, and I know he is ready to welcome back all, not just some, but all of his old regulars and then some. Check him out, 225 Smith Street in Perth Amboy. It is worth checking him out, I promise you. Jesus's spirit and optimism for the future is something we all share. And with everyone who lives, works, or studies in New Jersey now eligible for vaccination, it is up to us to move us even more quickly to the stronger, fairer, and more resilient future that we know awaits us. So again, start checking now for available appointments and get vaccinated as soon as you can. Together, we are going to continue to be a national leader. With that, it is now my pleasure to turn things over to the woman on my right, the state's epidemiologist stepping in for Health Commissioner Judy Persichelli. Please help me welcome Dr. Christina Tan. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. Throughout the pandemic, the department has been partnering with the New Jersey Poison Information Center to answer questions about the COVID-19 health emergency. Trained healthcare professionals at the call center have been available to the public since January of last year, and they've answered more than 100,000 calls. They continue to answer COVID-19 health-related questions, many of which lately are about the vaccine. The call center is there for residents of our state when they have concerns, and you can reach them 24 hours, seven days a week at 1-800-962-1253. So moving on to the department's daily report, there are 1,936 reports of CDC variants of concern in New Jersey. 1,815 of these reports are the B117 variant, the one that had uh, the variant uh, that had emerged from the UK. Additionally, there are 36 reports of P1 variant, uh, the variant emerging from Brazil, three reports of the B1351 variant uh, from South Africa, and 82 reports of B1427 and B1429, the variants that had emerged out of California. The increase in the number of variant cases reported today is due to previously unreported sequencing results from commercial laboratories. Since the last briefing, there has been one new report of multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children. There are 115 cumulative cases in the state, and one of these children is hospitalized. At the state's veterans' homes, there are no new cases among residents. At the state's psychiatric hospitals, there are two new cases among patients, one at the Trenton Hospital and the other one at Ann Klein Hospital. Um, regarding daily percent positivity as of Thursday, April 15th, uh, for the entire state, the uh, percent positivity is 8.18%. Um, uh, in the northern region, 8.17%. Central region, 7.81%. And the southern region, 8.91%. And that concludes the daily report. Please continue to mask up, social distance, stay home when you're sick, get tested, and get vaccinated. Tina, great to have you with us, as always, and thank you for uh, stepping in for the commissioner, who, by the way, is in great form, just could not be with us today. Again, thank you for everything. Um, 
Pat, great to have you. Um, compliance feels like it remains on the low side, which you can verify or, or challenge that. Weather's decent. Tomorrow, I think, is going to be the nicest day of the week, it looks like. But uh, again, we need to get ourselves more living outdoors than indoors. Um, and we still need more troopers to sign up to become, uh, or applicants, rather, to sign up to become troopers. So right. for all the above, great Thank to you, Governor. You. Good afternoon. Uh, since we last met, just one EO compliance that was reported to the Rock, that was Milburn Police, had responded to a domestic incident at a residence. Uh, that subject uh, resisted arrest, ultimately uh, spit on the arresting officer, and was COVID positive. Um, so Essex County Prosecutor's Office is reviewing additional charges that are pending against that individual in addition to the EO uh, complaint. Uh, to your point, Gov, weather is pretty decent. Uh, might be a little windy Wednesday and Thursday, but we're keeping an eye on that. Uh, and yes, as of this morning, we had just over 2,200 candidates apply. Uh, a, a reminder, njtrooper.com, that remains open until uh, Friday at midnight, so we only have really four and a half more days. Uh, it's been a full court press between the governor, myself, the attorney general, um, a lot of calls, radio shows, just really trying to get the word out there um, and hope that the women and men sign up uh, again to join us for our next century of service to, uh, to the great state of New Jersey. NJ Trooper. Dot com. Thanks, Governor. And Pat, we've got a meeting. Uh, you and Jared and, and the Attorney General and I are actually going to meet right after this, and that's going to be a topic uh, on our list. You were on WBLS on Sunday morning open line. Yeah, it was, it was great. One of the great, I, I think one of the singular great American call-in programs. Uh, just an incredible, uh, with, uh, with a lot of reach, by the way. So God willing, that'll bear some fruit. That was just yesterday morning. So the yeah, it was eight o'clock yesterday. Eight o'clock yesterday. So when does the deadline end again? Uh, this Friday, this Friday, the twenty third at eleven fifty nine. So yeah. uh, again, this group of pool of candidates will probably make up uh, the classes starting in January of uh, next year. Of next year, got it. Thank you. I think we'll start over here, Charlie, with you. Before we do, we're going to be, I think, on the regular rhythm this week. We'll be, um, we'll be uh, virtual tomorrow. Uh, and we will be back here unless you hear otherwise at one o'clock on Wednesday and to be determined how the balance of the week uh, looks, but we'll be out and about. Uh, and with that, Charlie, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, Actually, Charlie, before you, before you ask, I have to get something off my chest. I mentioned the Mets, Red Sox, Dodgers, New York football giants. One guy's opinion as a huge soccer fan, this Super League idea in Europe is total trash. It is against the fans' interests. It is all about greed, and I hope cooler heads prevail and put it right in, in the wastebasket where it belongs. Charlie, nothing personal. Over to you, because I know you were going to ask about that. <laughs> Thanks, Governor. Um, I have three items I want to ask about. The first, tomorrow Highland Park is holding an election that was actually supposed to be held in November. Uh, what went wrong and who's to blame for the delay? I um, wanted to ask if you have any comment on the uh, Middlesex County Democratic Organization's decision to uh, overrule the decision of the Edison Democratic Organization and award the coveted party line to a different set of local candidates. And then I have to ask about the Lincoln Annex School on August 28th. I'd be surprised if you didn't. So on August 28th, you spoke to two New Brunswick residents concerned about the plans to close and demolish the school. They tell me you promised to arrange a meeting with your acting education commissioner. On September 11th, your team told me DOE is going to bring those community members in for a meeting. Uh, it's my understanding that meeting never happened. On October 16th, the DOE told me they're working to reach out to parents of school-age students in the community to listen to their concerns. Um, I met your acting education commissioner here in December, and I emailed her to ask if these promises were going to be honored, and she has not responded to my emails. The school is currently being demolished, and its 700-plus students are now being bused to a warehouse building in a dangerous part of town. Um, what is your message to the families who have lost their school and what has your administration done to listen to them or hear them out uh, since these meetings didn't, didn't happen or didn't seem to happen? Yeah, I, I will, on the last one, I'll get Dan Bryan to follow up because it, it's not our intention to not follow up, I promise you that. Um, and as I've said this many times before, and I'll, I'll leave out all the editorializing, um, the um, the fact of the matter is we should be able to, and I'm highly 
optimistic we can have it both ways. In other words, build a new school that is 21st century in the right location for kids of the next generation to attend. I can't turn to Judy any today because she's, as you know, an alum of the school. She's not with us, but Tina and I will get the message to her, but also have a world-class cancer center. Um, and um, we should be able to walk and chew gum, and I'm confident that we can and will. And I, I'll get uh, Dan to follow up. Having said that, it's not our intention to not follow up. I'm going in reverse order. Uh, I've got no insights on the process, but I'm, I'm honored to to endorse uh, Sam Joshi, who is a guy I've known for a, a lot of years. Um, I think he'll be an outstanding mayor. Um, and I'm very excited to stand with him in the Slate and Edison and the Slate and Middlesex County, where I think Chairman uh, Kevin McCabe does an extraordinary job. I've literally got no insight on Highland Park. So can we come back to that? Um, I've got no insight as to why. It, uh, I think your question is why it went from November to today. Um, I got to come back to that. Good to see you. Matt. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. With declining cases and hospitalizations, is it safe to say that any fears of a possible third wave in the state is over? I, Matt, I apologize. I missed the beginning of that. Well, with the declines of, po of new cases and, and hospitalizations, is it safe to say that any fears of a possible third wave in the yep. state are over? Uh, last week, you said you owed residents guidance on proms and graduation. Some of those events are already starting to happen, and at college uh, graduations are less than a month away. What sort of changes can people expect? And tomorrow will mark two weeks since more than two dozen undo undocumented immigrants and allies began their hunger strikes. Is your office planning to continue conversations with advocacy, advocacy groups, excuse me, who say that the $40 million isn't enough? And is there any plans for talks with the legislature about bumping up that uh, amount of funding? Um. Matt, on the, I'll answer and then maybe ask Tina to come back on the, the first one to weigh in. Uh, she's far more qualified than I. I do like, it's, it's baby steps, but I do like, and I think we like, the fact that numbers are slowly beginning to go in a better direction. The RT slipped a little bit today, uh, but uh, when I say a little bit, a little bit. Um, but if you look at hospitalizations over the past number of days, ICU, um, ventilator use, it's slowly but surely beginning to go in the right direction. From my taste, at least, it's too early to declare victory. And we still have this nagging, naggingly high positivity rate. On weekends, it's dub low double digits, and weekdays, it's high single digits. So, uh, but again, um, slowly but surely. And when you have over 6 million shots in the arms, over half the 4.7 million adults, we want to get vaccinated. Get, uh, having been vaccinated, the weather getting a little bit better to allow us to live more of our lives outside. That's all cause for quiet, cautious optimism. Uh, guidance, I would hope soon. Um, I'm not sure it'll be this week, but we actually have a meeting on this very topic this afternoon, uh, but too early to give you an answer on, on proms, graduations, and other summer stuff. I think on our list are day, day camps, for instance. Uh, so we want to hit a, s several things. And conversations absolutely continue. I, I was on this morning with a, a labor leader um, whose ranks include a disproportionate among members of un, undocumented uh, brothers and sisters. I was on over the weekend with a leader back and forth uh, with notes of, of a leader in the Latino community. Our teams have been doing the same. Again, we want to try to get to a good place here, but I've got no, no news specific specifically to break. Tina, how do you feel about the numbers of late um, and where do you think we are right now? I um, would agree with you, Governor, that it might be a little too early to predict um, what our uh, trajectory is right now, but I think we can be cautiously optimistic. For example, uh, when we look at our Cali, our weekly Cali activity levels, um, we're starting to see um, the activities kind of dip a little bit, which is um, good to hear, uh, good to see um, in our Central West area. Um, but Right now, New Jersey, as well as the rest of the country, we kind of remain in this really delicate balance between trying to ba you know, balance, we've got a context of 
widely circulating virus um, that's still out in the community. We, we always hear about the New Jersey numbers, but we have to remember that nationally we're seeing about, you know, 60, you know, 67,000 um, cases, new cases a day, rolling average, seven day rolling average. Um, so that's a lot of disease activity. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's a delicate balance with um, the number of vaccines increasing over time as well. But we have to remember that that's why we have to still continue to keep up our guard that even even though you know we're getting our vaccination rates uh, our vaccination coverage up that doesn't help with the immediate issue that we've got a lot of a virus still circulating circulating in the community that you know whatever we do right now for vaccination the great coverage that we're doing that will have an, an impact a couple weeks out versus what we have to do now with our you know again uh, sounding like a broken record the um, the social distancing the masking the washing your hands the I'm um, staying home when you're sick I'm um, just continuing those efforts until you know we reach um, a better spot with um, uh, with all of our different metrics and with our vaccine coverage you know, I also, Tina, saw an implication, at least from Tony Fauci yesterday, in fact, I think he was explicit about it, that he was hoping that J&J &J would come back online as of Friday uh, in some form. And we've talked about this here, that form, uh, uh, an obvious form might be, I'm saying might be because I don't, we, we don't have any insights, but uh, okay for everybody except for childbearing age women uh, who are in that range. So. We shall see. Um, we still need J&J, &J, assuming it's safe and, uh, and it checks all the boxes. Um, we still need it as it relates especially to equity, to get to hard to reach places and communities and persons that, uh, that a two dose vaccine regime makes it really hard to do. Thank you. Alex, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, for Dr. Tan, since you're sitting in for the commissioner today, do you have numbers on our weekly supply of Pfizer and Moderna vaccines for this week and if it's going to be higher or lower than we've seen in, in previous weeks? For you, Governor Murphy, uh, New York State has passed a law repealing blanket immunity for nursing homes and health care providers. You signed a, a bill that was similar but not identical a year ago extending immunity to health care professionals. Do you think the legislature should revisit the immunity issue, and the wording in the bill is a little bit vague. Could that immunity bill apply to nursing homes if they're bad actors like the ones you've talked about? Israel has removed its outdoor mask mandate. Are you considering something similar? Because it's been shown that there's very little outdoor transmission of coronavirus. Similarly, the CDC said that there's a one in 10,000 chance of getting COVID from a surface. Are these cleaning efforts that folks, including your office, are doing, like cleaning pens after a bill signing hygiene theater at this point, and should they end? And lastly, for the Colonel, do you have any concerns or preparations for the aftermath of the Derek Chauvin verdict? And have you watched the Dante Wright video, and what do you think of it? I've never heard the, the phrase hygiene theater. I have to just say there's a first for everything, and that was uh, the first. Um, no particular, do you have the vote, the, the dose, can we come back to on, on doses? They have stayed, though, uh, Pfizer and Moderna have been steady, um, either flat or modestly up, and they've stayed that way for a couple of months uh, at least. And so we'll, we'll come back. Dan, will you help me with that? Uh, no comment. Um, no, not, no comment. I've got no insight on the immunity. I've got no insight in terms of any steps we might take, but I also am I'm, I'm not read, uh, read into the New York law. So if you can bear with us on that. I'm not sure we're going we're gonna to have a whole lot to say. Israel's done an extraordinary job, period. I mean, if you look at every metric, they've done an extraordinary job, particularly most recently in vaccinating, but we're not there yet on changing our mask mandates. Um, I hope we will be, um, but it's, you know, first of all, it's a much warmer weather country than we are state right now, so they can live, I've been there a bunch of times, I can tell you right now in mid to late April, they are outdoors in a big way and we're not quite there yet. Um, and we also have a rate of transmission that is much higher than in Israel right now, but I would hope we'd get there. I just can't tell you when. Surfaces, Tina, I'm gonna continue to be in the category, better to be safe than sorry. Um, we don't do it for theater, I promise you that. There is a mounting, a, a, a fair amount of mounting evidence that surfaces are not our challenge. You'll remember a year ago, we had uh, in the spring pitched discussions and debates about playgrounds in particular, 
Um, I think we're beyond the, the point where we think that's a prime source of infection, but I think we're still going to be better to be safe than sorry. You, you, you go on that, or I want to make sure. Yeah, you know, CDC has recently updated its um, cleaning and disinfection guidance. Um, that you know, it's absolutely correct that um, there is mounting evidence that um, you know surfaces, um, you know, fomites, um, uh, you know, aren't really the main mode of trans uh, transmission. But that said, you still have to clean. You still have to follow um, routine um, uh, efforts, uh, particularly for um, high touch areas. Is, but you know some of the processes can be somewhat modified and again I think that's one that's going to get better probably f faster in terms of what our mindset looks like um, Pat Alex had a question about the Chauvin um, trial in Minnesota which feels like it's coming to a head a any comments you want to have there if uh, we have we've been in uh, the last few weeks constant communication I think this is a case where we can't over communicate and that includes uh, from the governor's office urban city mayors this morning we we're on three separate phone calls law enforcement county prosecutors uh, I've been in touch with the colonel of the Minnesota State Police uh, US Attorney's Office FBI all of our national uh, intelligence partners uh, certainly director maple shop so um, like last summer, we uh, we just want to be prepared, uh, and we saw a lot of mass gatherings, uh, very peaceful ones, and we hope that that remains true. So we are, we're certainly monitoring that, and uh, and we'll be watching uh, as that verdict comes out. Uh, and I have watched the Dante Wright uh, video. I was it was tragic. Um, I don't know if it was a training issue, but when that resulted in the loss of his life. Um, just hard to watch and certainly a tragedy every as we've said many times every loss of life is a tragedy period full stop um, I think one of the things that Pat I think you and the Attorney General and uh, Jared faith leaders how many how many members Jared of your faith council these days 3,500 members that that are in a regular rotation of of conversations and, and the deepening of engagement between law enforcement and the communities they serve um, has listen I'm you never take literally anything for granted I know you guys don't but that um, has served as well to date and and God willing it will continue to you're good sir I assume you are you got any <laughs> you're still looking for the 20 <laughs> okay I will maybe try to find a beer or something like that we'll, we'll, something in kind thank you Dave good afternoon hi um, governor with the recent talk about booster shots being developed that may be needed annually there is increasing chatter we have noticed about this whole pandemic being exaggerated to control people and quote unquote train them to follow directives by having people wear masks and follow social distance protocols. Could you and Dr. Tan, the Colonel, and perhaps Jared Maples comment from your own personal experience, have you ever seen a health emergency as serious as the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, has there been any word, I know we just mentioned that um, Pfizer and Moderna supplies have been basically steady. Is there any discussion or a word about supplies being possibly increased and with the percentage of minority members getting vaccinated, um, Judy was saying last week, I believe it was 8% blacks, I think Hispanics were 15%. 19, I believe. Okay, 19%. Shockingly low still compared to whites, 56 no, or 7%. No, no, that's not what she meant. She meant 8%, I believe, and I, she's, she's not here, so I want to make sure. 8% as relates to 13% representation in our state. And the 19 was 19 as it relates to 20 or 21 percent of the of the Latino population. Okay, so then not as bad. As, correct. As, as I, I want to make sure that be. I believe that's correct. We'll we'll confirm that with you. Okay. If that is correct, still though there is a lag in the minority. There's community. no question. Yep. Um, so what kind of efforts, if any, you know, have you guys discussed, or are there plans in the work to yep. to try to increase this? And finally. On the metrics slowly improving, and you just said, um, Governor, that it's too early to really talk about specific expansion, reopening efforts, but they are coming. Um, what's the message? What do you say to people who say this is way too slow? 
Thank you. Yeah, your first question and your, your, your last one, Dave, are sort of two sides of a different coin. I was tempted to say that we have been possessed by aliens uh, trying to control uh, the humans in New Jersey. Uh, uh, but all kidding aside, um, I don't know. I don't know how anyone, and I'm not, this is not directed at you. I don't know how anyone could look at over 25,000 deaths in this state in 13 months and not conclude that this was an incredibly serious health crisis. And look at the amount of deaths, Tina, that we even reported today. Another. 18 confirmed losses of life today and another couple of dozen in our hospitals unconfirmed. This is, by any measure, a once in a century at least, uh, if not bigger than that, whatever that would be, uh, health crisis and pandemic. And we're not out of the woods. And that gets to the question of the slowness. Um, I would love to be a less dense state that has warmer weather uh, more often in the year as it relates to a pandemic. I love how we're situated in normal times. Our density, our location are two of our great attributes when you're talking about uh, most of uh, what New Jersey's about away from a pandemic. But in a pandemic, our density, our proximity to New York City, it's not just the densest state in the nation, the densest region. We've been indoors for most of our lives the past now going four to six months. Um, we just don't have the latitude that other states that don't have that density and, and, and don't have that weather reality have. Again, I love our location. I love our weather patterns for everything, frankly, except the pandemic. So, though, and the other thing is this, we pride ourselves in not lurching, in other words, letting, you know, opening up a, a capacity and then going back. We haven't done it once. We came close on, uh, on indoor dining uh, leading up to the 4th of July, which sadly had to get postponed for health reasons until Labor Day. But we haven't done that once. And, uh, and I'm, I think that should be a badge of honor for New Jersey, not just for us, but for all of us, that folks, proprietors, Look at the, 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 and that's not to say there may be, not be people who are getting away with stuff who we're not looking, but enforcement is high. Um, and that most people, if you measure by the compliances, remember like six months ago, you would, you had like 13, 15 in one press conference. And we were doing more press conferences a week. So I would just say it's to everyone's credit that we've been able to do this as incrementally. And again, I'm, I, I want to get out of this as much as anybody. And I continue to believe, Dave, that Memorial Day brings us to a, a, a dramatically different place. Um, I don't have any sense that the supply of Moderna and Pfizer is going up meaningfully. Having said that, um, assuming Dr. Fauci is right and we get J&J &J back at least to some degree and Pfizer and Moderna stay steady, I reiterate what we've been saying now, Tina, for a couple of weeks. I have complete confidence we'll be able to get to our goal of 4.7 million adult New Jerseyans vaccinated by the end of June. Uh, I would hope even before. Um, in the black and brown community uh, is, is an incredibly important question and I'm glad you raised it. Again, J&J, &J, it's not just the total supply that is impacted when one of these vaccines come off. It's that is the supply, that is the vaccine, pardon me, that allows us to pursue equity most aggressively. That's not to say we can't do it with Pfizer and Moderna, and obviously the facts show that we are doing it uh, with, with them, but not at the pace we would like. Remember, only 4%, and I think, Tina, that number is now even lower. That was as of the end of the week. Less than 4% of our total vaccines administered are J&J. &J. So that, that's the good news. We haven't had, we haven't had an over-reliance on it. The, the challenging news is it's the single dose it's the regular refrigeration, you point and shoot. It's the one Judy wants to put in the back of the mobile vans and just drive into deep into neighborhoods. So I think it's gonna be a combination. And by the way, if it has to be Moderna and Pfizer, um, we will figure it out. Uh, it will be more complicated. But I think it's going to be a combination in terms of equity. God willing, we'll get J&J &J back online. It'll be mobile, it'll be faith. 
Um, it'll be community centers, federally qualified health care centers. It'll be a combination of a lot of things. We're up over 800 locations. I mentioned this earlier today, and I mentioned that 98.7% of folks live within five miles of a vaccine site. We're up to 814 locations. Um, our goal is to get sites so uh, uh, dispersed that you're within 15 minutes of a walk to a site, and we believe that's achievable. So for all the above, um, it, it remains a journey, and, uh, and we will do what it takes even if we don't get J&J back online. Thank you. Nikita, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, so Assemblyman Nicholas Sherov Lavlati is no longer seeking re-election. I'm wondering if you have comment on the loss of someone who has been a legislative ally of yours, and also whether you share his frustration over party leaders in Hudson essentially designating legislators without uh, any sort of process. Uh, on a similar note, have you met uh, the Assemblyman's replacement, William Sampson? Uh, separately, uh, you are now unopposed in the primary. Congratulations. I'm wondering how much time you plan to spend campaigning between now and June 8th. And then finally, I wanted to see if you agreed with Secretary Way's referral of Lisa McCormick's petitions to law enforcement and whether or not you believe the state should actually, actively rather, investigate allegations of voter fraud like these. Um. Let me start from the top. Nick and I had a very um, private and but yet um, soulful exchange this morning. He's a friend. I think he's been an outstanding assemblyman. But I have to say Jimmy Davis is a friend, and I think he's been an outstanding mayor, and sometimes these things happen. And you've got two folks you have a high regard for, and you just wish and hope that they can find common ground, and they were not able to. Um, but I think he is, he's been an outstanding assemblyman. And I said to him, no matter what walks of life he or I may stumble through uh, in the years ahead, I hope that we can stay close. And I thank him for his service. Um, I have not met his designated uh, successor. I say successor, obviously he has to win some elections, but I've not yet met him uh, and I look forward to. Listen, I think we'll take it uh, as we have from moment one. We're going to, you know, Frank Lautenberg had that great line, there's only two ways to run, scared or unopposed. Uh, whether we're opposed or not, we run scared. Um, and this is not a, a, a venue for politics, but I will say that we, we run like we're 10 behind. Um, now how that actually, what that looks like, given we're in a pandemic, um, you know, it won't be, my guess is it won't be the traditional big rallies that you would associate in a normal time with a, with a political campaign, but we're, we're taking it very seriously. Um, real, real quick, only because I'm being incredibly gracious today, we're going to give you... And, and I appreciate it. I'm just and you won't forget this moment ever. <laughs> in terms of like uh, days or hours in a given week, I'm wondering how, no, how much you, time you plan to spend campaigning. No, no uh, designated. We're, we're good, um, Aswin. Um, this is Aswin's last week, by the way, with us. This is a... Uh, will you be with us on Wednesday? You will. No, I'll be with you maybe Friday. Okay, maybe Friday. Um, thank you for your service, and good luck in your next chapters. I don't have a, a, a budgeted time. Uh, what we've been doing is a lot of Zooms. Uh, and, you know, we basically, I, and I, I have to obviously be careful. I can't be in a government building doing anything political, so I end up pulling up stakes and go s somewhere else, and that will continue to be the case. A lot of it's virtual. I have no comment uh, on the specifics of, of, uh, of Lisa McCormick's referral by the Secretary of State. Um, I'll leave that process um, uh, to its own resolution. Um, but I would say this, our, our voting laws are exactly what they are. They're laws. <laughs> they have to be respected, including by us and anyone else who runs. They have to be taken seriously. They have to be adhered to. You can't get too close to any lines. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and again, no comment on her specific situation, but the fact of the matter is we have to take this stuff seriously, and I'm glad we are. So with that, Tina, I'm going to mask up, if it's okay with you. Quick, quick swig. By the way, while, for you soccer fans, while I'm up, up here, UEFA has just thrown Man Manchester City, Real Madrid, and who else was in this thing? 
PSG out of the Champions League and have awarded it to, to Chelsea, Pat. So there, who the heck knows? Um, thank you all. Tina, thank you. Pat, thank you. NJTrooper.com. You have till the end of the week. Please, folks, uh, line up. Jared, Paramel, Dan, Aswin, everybody, keep doing what you're doing. Please get vaccinated. This vaccine finder, can we pull that slide up one more time, Dan? Can we pull the vaccine finder slide up one more time? Is that possible? That thing's been a godsend. There we go. That website's incredibly important and very valuable, and it's been accessed by tons of people, and it gets refreshed multiple times an hour. So it addresses the issue which we rightfully had early on, depending on when you logged on, uh, dictated whether or not, just by happenstance, by pure luck, whether or not you get an appointment. This uh, attempts to solve that riddle. Folks, keep doing what you've been doing by the millions in proprietors, restaurants, small businesses, bars, whatever it might be, by the tens of thousands. Uh, we are getting there. There's no question about it. Keep up the great work. God bless you all.